Low Reynolds number flows are reversible when the direction of motion of the boundaries which gave rise to the flow is reversed. This may lead to some surprising situations which might almost make one believe that the fluid has a memory of its own. Here are two concentric cylinders. The fluid can be moved by turning the inner cylinder with this handle. The annulus between them is filled with glycerine. Into this space I introduce some dye which stays put owing to the high viscosity of the glycerine. Note its position before I start turning it. I now turn it four times, pushing the handle clockwise. The dye seems to mix as a drop of milk mixes when it is stirred into a cup of tea. Now I reverse the direction. And after turning exactly four turns, the dyed area reappears in its original position with a little fuzziness due to molecular diffusion. To see what happens, we have a second apparatus that is filled with syrup. It has a wider gap and we can look down on it. A little coloured syrup is injected to mark the fluid. When the cylinder is turned, this fluid is stretched round the annulus. Now the inner cylinder is turned back exactly to its starting position. During the forward motion, the boundary of the fluid follows a path determined at each instant by the motion of the wall. At these very low Reynolds numbers, particles within the fluid move when the boundary moves and they stop when it stops. During the reversed motion, the boundary of the fluid retraces exactly the path it followed during its forward motion and the particles return to their original position. The motion of a rigid body is also reversible. Here is one with a gap to mark its orientation. This is set initially in the 12 o'clock position. The motion carries the body around and also makes it rotate. On reversing, the rigid body returns to its original position and orientation. If, however, a flexible body, like this bit of yarn, is inserted, the reversal of stress will alter the shape of the body so that it will not return to its original position. All the familiar self-propelling bodies owe their thrust to inertial reaction of air or water to the motion of their propelling mechanisms. The propeller of a motorboat is an example. Here the water which is thrown backwards forms a well-defined wake. The body and tail of a fish form another example, but here the wake is not so well defined.
Even a snake swims by moving its body so that each section of it is pushed forward by inertial reaction as the waves of bending move them obliquely in the water. All those we have seen have Reynolds numbers of order thousands or even millions. Microscopic creatures, which may have Reynolds numbers as low as 1 over 10,000, cannot derive any appreciable thrust from inertia. They rely on moving their bodies in such a way that they derive their thrust from viscous stresses. The tails of these bull spermatozoa move like those of tadpoles or snakes by sending waves of bending backwards so that each section moves obliquely in the fluid. Here, however, the viscous reaction to the motion pushes on the tails in the same way that it pushed on the obliquely falling rod. To illustrate the difference between inertial and viscous propulsion, I have constructed two models, both operated by the same source of power, a twisted elastic band. In this model, a rudder-like tail oscillates about a hinge at the rear. Waving the rudder of a boat is so well known as a method of propulsion that the rules of yacht racing legislate against it. Putting this model in water shows us why. But when the model is put into syrup, it cannot move. Owing to the reversibility of low Reynolds number flow, the forward motion of the blade is neutralized by the backward motion. This spiral model does swim. Each element of the spiral is behaving like the obliquely falling rod. Because lateral resistance is greater than longitudinal, motion at right angles to the axis of the spiral can contribute to a longitudinal component. The spirals are right and left-handed to keep the model from rotating. 